Hi, welcome to my channel Explain. My name is EK and in this video I'm giving you the second instalment of my vague history of Scotland. Although this episode is rather less vague uh, than previous iterations. In the last video I brought you up to date with the monarchs of Scotland starting with Malcolm III in the 11th century to the death of Alexander III in the 13th. And now we turn to the events after 1286. Yes, that is right. Friends, Romans, country people. It is the moment you have all been waiting for. The Wars of Independence, aka RTB O'Clock, aka Indie Ref 1. But before we get to the glory and gore, and there is plenty of both, we must first unravel the spiderweb of circumstances that allowed a young man named Robert the Bruce to define Scottish history for 700 years. It all began in 1286 with the death of Alexander III who fell off his horse because it was too dark. Traditionally Alexander's reputation is glowing but voices of dissent are becoming uh, louder with claims that his kind of successes were mostly down to, to quote Richard Oram, lucky mediocrity which a savage, b I reckon that the kind of the decades of conflict that took place after Alexander's death gave his reign kind of a sense of nostalgia that later historians fitted into this kind of wider story of the Wars of Independence where Robert and his allies are kind of pitched as seeking to restore the glory, um, the glory days of Alexander as Scotland's monarch. Regardless of his personal abilities to rule, Alexander III had failed to provide the future of the royal dynasty. Alexander had three children with his first wife, Margaret of England. He had two sons and one daughter. All three of Alexander's children predeceased their father and only the daughter, also named Margaret, had her own issue and that issue was a daughter also named Margaret, with the King of Norway. Scottish royals have a daughter and don't name her Margaret Challenge. I'm just saying. Alexander III had made his nobles formally recognise Margaret the Maid of Norway um, as his heir prior to Alexander's death. A, EK film video where you don't have to add in loads of shit that you forgot to say, challenge. And B, what was B? Oh, I didn't say why she was, so Margaret, the, 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 the third Margaret, the Margaret who was the daughter of, of Margaret, Mar oh my god, I literally, the Margaret in question, the granddaughter of Alexander the third, to differentiate her from every other Margaret that was in Scotland at this time, but especially her mother who had died, um, was known as the Maid of Norway. I don't know if she was really like known of it mm, at the time much, but certainly that is what she has kind of been known to history as. Um, and when he died, this worked. Scotland acknowledged her as their kind of sovereign lady. This little queen remained in Norway for a time, partly because of her youth, uh, but also because the bickering nobles couldn't settle how her reign was going to look. A set of six guardians uh, were selected to form a sort of regency council, um, and the most pressing issue was who would Margaret marry? Whoever married Margaret had the chance to kind of rule Scotland as king in practice, if not in name. Two treaties were signed in relation to this. The first in 1289 saw the Scots, the King of Norway and Edward I of England agreeing that any betrothals had to wait, writing that quote, the aforesaid Queen shall come to the Kingdom of Scotland before the Feast of All Saints next to come, free and quit of all contract of marriage and espousal. There's kind of an undercurrent, I think they talk about there being war and like we can't bring her over until that's kind of settled, but there's also kind of an implication or a fear uh, on the part of the Scots that Edward will kind of get hold of her um, as she makes the journey and kind of take her to England and force her to marry his son, also called Edward, um, kind of immediately. Uh, so there's a little bit of distrust but also kind of a, a realist understanding that they all need to agree and that they all need to have input maybe. But who am I? Who to know? Who Who would I know? Edward I of England, who was the maid's great uncle, was absolutely insistent that his son and heir, also called Edward, would be her husband, thus amalgamating the two nations in, quote, peaceful union, and a second treaty signed in 1290 agreed to this. So, in 1290, the seven-year-old queen left her homeland to take her throne and promptly died on her journey without ever setting foot in mainland Scotland. Bummer. 
There's no way this could get any worse. It's worse. Scotland was in quite the quandary. There were 13 possible claimants to this now vacant throne, but the most important were John Balliol and Robert de Brew, 5th Lord of Annandale. He's not the one to get excited about, but he was the kind of patriarch of the de Brew uh, lot at this point. Both, uh, Bally is it Balliol or Balliol? I'm going with Balliol and saying it with confidence. Both Balliol and de Brew were descended from David, the Earl of Huntington, who was the younger brother of Malcolm IV and William the Lion. Both Balliol and Brew were descended via David's daughters, Margaret and Isabella, but Robert was one generation closer to the royal ancestor. He was the great-great-grandson of David I, while John Balliol was the great-great-great-grandson. However, John Balliol was descended from the elder daughter, Margaret, so which is going to triumph, you know, the man who's closer in generation or the one de descended from the elder line? Yes, it's family tree time. So we've got David I of Scotland, who was the King of Scotland. He had several sons um, and David, the Earl of Huntingdon, was his heir. But David, the Earl of Huntingdon, died before his father. So David the First's other sons became king in turn. And then the son, one of them's sons had issue, which like went all the way down to the situation we have now um, with the Maid of Norway. But David, the Earl of Huntingdon, had, um, he had quite a few sons and one of his sons, Henry, was also the Earl of Huntingdon. He had several children, including two daughters. Margaret, um, Margaret's grandson was John Balliol, the John Balliol that we're talking about now. And Isabella's son was Robert, the fifth Lord of Annandale, Robert de Brew. So at this point in the 1290s, this is the Robert that we're talking about. So, and then he died and then he died and then we get Robert the Bruce. So that is why Robert the fifth kind of had a closer claim because David the first of Scotland was his great, great granddad. Whereas John Balliol, um, like the relationship between John Balliol and David the first of Scotland was his great, great, great granddad so i hope that clears up i fucking love a family tree i can't lie uh peace to cut through this gordian knot and prevent civil war the nobles turned to their southern neighbor and asked edward the first to intervene and he did not need to be asked twice as david ross writes quote the geese had invited the fox to dinner and edward was bent on seizing quote a full active and permanent suzerainty over the kingdom to the north the victor of this drama's first act was john balliol he had the support of the influential common family who will themselves take a starring role later and the bishop of st andrews and he kind of successfully persuaded england of his suitability balliol's kingship is often considered kind of simply a string of instances of him handing Scotland up to Edward I on a silver platter. His coronation in November of 1292, for example, was, to quote Ross, overseen by Edwardian officials rather than the traditional Scottish elves and churchmen. However, in the summer of 1294, when Balliol resisted orders to send men to fight in Edward's armies, conflict erupted and Edward burned the town of Berwick. But when the Scottish army fled the fight at Dunbar, John was ousted and, quote, stripped of his royal vestments. Edward of England had no intention of allowing another king to succeed John, and almost, quote, all the men of substance in Scotland swore fealty to Edward, signing documents that are collectively known as the Ragman Roll. And so it seemed that just a decade after Alexander III's death, the flame of Scottish independence had been snuffed out, leaving the realm in darkness. But not for long. In May of 1297, a man by the name of William Wallace killed the Sheriff of Lanark, an Englishman named William Hesselrig. This event was not the first act of rebellion. Smouldering unrest had been building uh, since the moment Edward I returned to England but it was the spark which caught. William and a man named Andrew Murray served as, quote, guardians in a new context, not as regents, but as leaders of anti-English resistance. One of the men who flocked to this resistance was the grandson of Robert de Brew, the fifth Lord of Annandale, who had been uh, one of the claimants to the throne after the Maid of Norway's death. This grandson is known to history not as Robert de Brew, which is a French name, but Robert 
the Bruce. Bruce likely still hoped to make good on his family's claim to the throne, but at this point at least, uh, the opposition to Edward of England was seeking the restoration of John Balliol, who at this point was in exile in France. In September of 1297, Wallace and Andrew Murray delivered the English soldiers under the Earl of Surrey a quote, wholly unexpected defeat at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Prior to the battle, the Earl of Surrey had tried to negotiate with the rebels, but Wallace was having none of it, and according to the chronicler of Walter of Giesborough, replied thus, Go back and tell your people that we have not come here for peace. We are ready, rather, to fight to avenge ourselves and to free our country. Let them come up to us as soon as they like, and they will find us prepared to prove... tell your people that we have not come here for peace we are ready rather to fight to avenge ourselves and to free our country let them come up to us as soon as they like and they will find us prepared to prove the same in their beards the next year saw further victories with Wallace and his ally Murray evidently perceiving themselves as quote leaders of the armies of Scotland in the name of King John Bale a year later, however, in July of 1298, Wallace met with defeat at the Battle of Falkirk and was forced to flee. The struggle against Edward continued, but with less effectiveness, and many of Scotland's nobles, including Robert the Bruce, returned to the King's Peace under Edward. In 1304, Stirling Castle was taken by the English after a siege, and in 1305, Wallace was captured, brought to London, and put on trial, where he, quote, denied the charge of treason since he had never sworn allegiance to Edward. He was found guilty and immediately sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and courted. His biographer states, quote, he was to be drawn on a hurdle to the gallows at Smithfield, hanged, his heart and bowels taken out and burnt, his body courted, his head was to be cut off and placed on London Bridge, his quarters displayed at Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling and Perth. Edward might have felt confident at this point that the threat had been eliminated and the most powerful opposition in Scotland neutralised. What Edward didn't know, couldn't know, was that one of his newly loyal magnates had no intention of remaining loyal, and with John Balliol consigned to irrelevance, this magnate was preparing to seize the opportunity for the crown. This magnate, of course, was Robert the Bruce. As early as 1304, he agreed with the Bishop Lamberton to, quote, help each other in times of peril, conspicuously not saving their fealty to Edward I or any other king. Bruce's father had died in March of that year, making Robert VII Lord of Annandale and now a claimant to the throne. Yet on the face of it, Bruce remained loyal to Edward. In 1305, he was made part of a council convened to support the English regime. Um, perhaps he was biding his time or waiting to see what might be gained from supporting Edward. It's impossible to know. Regardless of his inner motivations, in 1306, he made his first play. Every book I have covering Scotland in this period mentions the 10th of February 1306. For on that day, Robert the Bruce and his main rival to the throne, John Comyn III, the Earl of Badenoch, Comyn's father, also called John Comyn, had been a potential competitor for the crown in the 1290s. Uh, they met at the Franciscan Monastery of Greyfriars in Dumfries. What happened within those walls, we will never know. But by the end of it, Comyn was dead on the high altar and Bruce was preparing to name himself king. Most historians kind of speculate that they had met to discuss a possible alliance or perhaps Bruce suspected Comyn of betrayal, that Comyn had kind of divulged Bruce's intent to rebel against Edward to the English. We will never know and I think that kind of aura of mystery is part of what makes this kind of such an iconic and compelling moment in the history of this era. It also stands as a challenge to the, the glorious mythos that has surrounded Bruce, um, a challenge that can never truly be answered and kind of one that threatens to tarnish Bruce's reputation. It does feature in John Barber's The Bruce, but only very briefly. I was in the third grade. <laughs> People treated me like a criminal! Because I killed somebody! Regardless of kind of the whys or wherefores, most historians agree that this incident catalyzed Robert's overt seizure of the throne. Robert is very much giving, like, the king can't have a go at me for killing people if I'm the king. Which, you know, like, I mean, he's not wrong. As David Ross presents it, quote, The effect was to force Bruce onwards to his goal. There was no going back. 
And so in March of 1306, Robert and his wife, Elizabeth de Burr, were crowned at Schoon near Perth. This next bit, very, very small incidental detail, one of my favourite things that I've ever heard in any kind of history. I don't know why I find this so fascinating, but I do, so maybe you will too. Traditionally, a member of the Macduff family had the honour of crowning the king, but the leader of that family at this point, Duncan II, was in English captivity. He had a sister named Isabella, who had married the cousin of the John Common that Bruce had slain. This cousin was the Earl of Buchan, he was also called John Common. Um, he had participated in the resistance of the late 1290s, but after being captured by Edward had joined the kind of pro-English faction. Isabella, however, did not, and in defiance of her husband's allegiance, she took on the duty of Clan Macduff and arrived to crown Bruce as Robert I. Unfortunately, she was a couple of days late and uh, missed the coronation, so they simply did it again, because it wouldn't be seen as kind of proper without somebody from the Macduff family having participated. I just, I just adore that. I love that she rebelled against her husband. I love that she kind of took on this duty. She was like, no, brother Duncan, um, you're in English captivity. Sorry about that. I will go and do it though. Don't worry, I've got it. Um, and I love that clearly this role was seen as so important that they had the coronation again. According to the historian Andrew Lang, Robert's queen, Elizabeth, was said to have lamented, quote, alas, we are but king and queen of the May, indicating kind of a very pessimistic assessment of her husband's chances against Edward. And the first years of Robert's reign certainly had great swathes of defeat. He kind of came out the gate running. He was traveling far and wide to demand the allegiance of his countrymen, but in June of 1306, he was defeated at the Battle of Methven by English forces under the Earl of Pembroke. Bruce fled and was forced into hiding. His wife, Elizabeth, his daughter, Marjorie, uh, who was his daughter from his first marriage, his two sisters, Christina and Mary, and the aforementioned Isabella Macduff were all captured. At some point, Elizabeth wrote to the English king, uh, informing him of the poor conditions in which she'd been kept, um, and her captivity eventually improved. She was pretty lucky in this respect. Mary and Isabella were confined for several years in cages. There is an excellent tale about Robert um, during these years as a fugitive in the Hebrides, and like all excellent tales, it's probably not true. It tells of him watching a spider trying to spin its web again and again, always failing, but always trying. And this site apparently fortified his resolve and jump-started the next era of the Wars of Independence. From this period onwards, Bruce adopted a very different tactic that we would probably call guerrilla warfare, um, but was more commonly known to contemporaries just as like secret warfare. Uh, Bruce was not without support. He had a lot of the bishops on his side and various barons, but he had neither the men nor the resources to kind of push in the English and Edwards um, Scottish allies from Scotland in one fell swoop. So he organised and fought from the shadows in a campaign of, to quote Ross, attrition and burnings of sudden appearances and swift disappearances. Another historian and biographer of Robert named Barrow describes Robert's campaigns, quote, dependence on infantry, scorched earth, guerrilla raids and sorties and the systematic demolition of castles and fortifications. The English, in his view, must be so harassed and exhausted that they would come to feel that Scotland was not worth the effort and expense of conquest. It did not take long for England to feel the burn. At some point between November of 1306 and March of 1307, Edward I declared through his representatives in Scotland that, quote, all rebels in the war previous to the Battle of Methven or in the battle or after and who surrender shall be sent to such prisons as the king orders and not released until the king's pleasure is taken. Those of Robert de Bruce's party or who advised in any way the rising against the king by preaching to the people are to be arrested with the clerks or laymen and imprisoned. By 1309, Bruce had won several prominent nobles to his cause. He had convened a parliament at St Andrews and had kind of somewhat restored diplomatic ties with France. He set about securing various regions and not always through kind of an inspiring patriotism. He enforced a sort of 
protection racket at times where those kind of remaining faithful to Edward either sincerely or just through pragmatism were forced to kind of pay for immunity from Bruce's attacks. England held some of the most significant fortresses and towns in Scotland including Edinburgh and Stirling as well as Perth, Jedburgh, Roxburgh and Berwick. Some were besieged by Robert's forces, but he lacked the resources to kind of apply that strategy wholesale. So he took to grappling hooks fixed to ladders made of rope. In 1312, the town of Perth fell, quote, almost without a fight after Bruce himself led a group of soldiers to wade through the moat and scale the town's walls. In February of 1314, James Douglas took Roxburgh Castle, attacking in the dead of night by, quote, crawling on their hands and knees. And in March of 1314, Robert's nephew, Thomas Randolph, took Edinburgh. The story goes, one of my favourite stories in this little snippet of history, was that Randolph had a secret weapon, a young man named William Francis who had grown up in the castle as the son of a steward. If you've visited Edinburgh and seen the castle, its strength is immediately obvious because it sits on a kind of upthrust of volcanic rock. The only approach is from the east as the north, west and south are pretty much almost sheer drops. But Francis knew how to scale these rock faces why? Because he had made the journey several times when sneaking out to meet his sweetheart in the town below. Some of Randolph's men were sent to launch an attack on the eastern approach to divert attention away from Francis and his fellow climbers, who then threw down rope ladders for the remaining soldiers to climb up and overpower the soldiers inside. Um, excuse me, what the actual fuck are you doing in my house? castle did not have long to appreciate its change of regime. As had been the case with the castles of Roxburgh, Douglas, Inverness and Aberdeen, Robert's men burned it to prevent it returning to the hands of the English as they had not the strength to keep and defend it. Robert was in a fair position by the spring of 1314 and these guerrilla tactics were serving him well. He likely had no intention of kind of facing the English army in the field or at least not at this point but events out with his control were about to force his hand. And by events, I mean his younger brother, Edward. And there were three other Bruce brothers, Nigel, sometimes also called Neil, Thomas and Alexander, but all three had been executed by the English, leaving Edward Bruce and Robert. Edward Bruce had enjoyed success fighting for Robert's cause. He had invaded Galloway in June of 1308 and is recorded as Lord of Galloway in the parliament that Robert had held in 1309. Uh, Edward was also made the Earl of Carrick in 1313, although Thomas Randolph seems to have been kind of favoured by by Robert over Edward. Um, he was made royal lieutenant for his royal uncle. In light of this, Edward Bruce's actions in 1314 might have kind of sprouted from a desire to prove himself. Alternatively, they might kind of justify Robert's, you know, any uncertainty that Robert had in his brother's judgment. Regardless, the result is the same. In 1314, the castle of Stirling was under siege by the Scots. It was in the hands of Sir Philip Mowbray, a Scot who was loyal to England. Uh, England was now under Edward II, who had ascended to the throne in 1307, um, after the death of Edward I. Edward Bruce negotiated with Mowbray and the two agreed that unless the English army arrived to break the siege before Midsummer's Day of that year, the castle would be handed over bloodlessly to the Scots. This was not a battle that Robert the Bruce sought. His success had been the kind of hit and run, scorched earth, you know, the stealth tactics of rope ladders and grappling hooks. Yet the choice was not his in truth, as honour demanded the participation of both Robert and Edward II in quote, chivalric compact of the kind that Robert I deplored. The scene was set, the set was dressed, and in June of 1314, the two armies met in the boggy marshland under Stirling Castle. Now, a brief aside, if you follow me on Instagram, you might have noticed that I occasionally make a light-hearted meme about my mild disinterest in military history. Uh, you may also notice that people, specifically World War II bros, let's be honest, lose their shit at this. You would truly think that I'd eaten a newborn baby on Instagram Live. Um, and just to wrinkle their tiny minds even further, there are two exceptions to my disinclination to learn about tanks and infantry. Firstly, the Battle of Helm's Deep, and secondly, the Battle of Bannockburn.
The exact location of the battlefield is disputed, but the guidebook produced by the National Trust for Scotland for the Battle of Bannockburn Visitor Centre suggests that Bruce raised his standard just west of the old Roman road and that Edward's forces set up in a place called the Cars, which was further to the east of that road. The Bannock Burn, burn meaning stream, uh, flows to the south. The exact numbers on the field, as is often the case, are in dispute. The National Trust for Scotland writes that Robert had perhaps 6,000 men, while it is estimated that Edward's troops numbered around 18,000. Edward had more than 2,000 knights to Robert's 500 horsemen, and his infantry probably outnumbered Robert's by nearly 3 to 1. Whatever the headcount, it was truly a David and Goliath affair. Richard Oram reckons Edward II had about 16 men against Robert's 8,000. No offence to Robert the Bruce, but I think think if, as I just said, Edward had brought 16 men to the battle to Robert the Bruce's 8,000, I don't think uh, the battle would be pitched as such an unexpected defeat. And Michael Lynch gives between 15 and 20,000 to Edward. But no matter how you cut it, Edward's forces should have won the day. Why then didn't they? There's a few factors. One, the entire area was just a collection of bogs, according to Richard Oren. Edward II was obliged to spend, quote, considerable energy in navigating the streams and kind of marshy ground with his enormous army. Second of all, Robert's forces dug spiked pits to hamper Edward II's mounted soldiers. Edward had more mounted soldiers than Bruce, and in this period, mounted soldiers were a big deal in warfare. So your cavalry is not as big as the enemy's. What do you do to level that out? Well, you dig some pits, shove some big old sharpened spears of wood in and cover it up a bit. Boom, job done. A third technique, tactic, stratagem that Bruce used was shiltrons, sometimes called shiltroms or hedgehogs. These were, according to the National Trust of Scotland, Robert's supreme weapon, and they are deceptively simple. You essentially get a big old bunch of soldiers with spears and have them packed together and move as one, like a mobile little hedgehog, with the soldiers in the front kind of kneeling with their spears pointed to the outside, a bit like a kind of reverse phalanx. They had to be disciplined enough to stay in formation and to kind of close ranks uh, every time one of their members died. And according to the National Trust of Scotland, the only way to break the shield from was to kill so many that the ranks were no longer solid and the cavalry could find a way through. I must say, far be it from me to, you know, opine on military history, but I feel like before modern warfare, there was a lot to be said for standing close to your fucking, like, brothers in arms. Like, we got shield walls, we got phalanx turtle things, we got this, we got pipe pushes, like, just, I guess that's the goal, you know, you, you just all hold hands and kind of snuggle up together. There's also some kind of miscellaneous elements of the battle that either tipped the scales in Bruce's favour or were perhaps the result of other factors that tipped the scales in Bruce's favour and that these elements kind of just serve to simply uh, highlight the improving chances of the Scots. Kind of a chicken and egg scenario. At some point on the first day of the fighting, the 23rd, an English knight named Henry de Bohan saw Bruce uh, inspecting some of his troops on horseback. Seeking to end the battle before it had really begun, Bohan took up his lance and charged towards Bruce, who was armed only with an axe. Now, no matter how effusive the descriptions of this incident are, no matter how romanticised or embellished, there is no denying that it is badass. John Barber spends 50 lines on this action alone, which is several lines more than he spent on the time that Robert Bruce murdered a fellow noble in a church in Dumfries, but that's by the by. The National Trust for Scotland summarises the purported fate of Bohan's kind of vainglorious attempt, writing, quote, Robert coolly swerved at the last moment, stood in his stirrups and struck a deadly blow on de Bohan's head, breaking his battle axe in the action. You're not that guy, pal. Trust me. You're not that guy. Okay. Yeah. And you? Absolutely. And according to some historians, Robert's immediate response was to bemoan the loss of his favorite axe. This motherfucker don't miss. No, he's fucking good. That motherfucker don't miss, man. He's good. In the heat of battle, he don't miss. No. In the heat of controversy, he don't miss. No. The night 
December 23rd also saw some defections of Scots that had been fighting alongside Edward, like the landowner Sir Alexander Seaton. On the 24th, Bruce's tactics continued to deny England the opportunity to use their greater numbers, and so Edward II turned and fled, along with the Earl of Pembroke who had defeated Bruce at the Battle of Methven. Uh, they left in the direction of Stirling Castle, but the Castellan Sir Philip Mowbray stayed true to his word and prepared to surrender the castle to the Scots, leaving Edward to flee south with Bruce's right-hand man, Sir James Douglas, on his tail. The battle was over and the day was won. In the received tradition of Scottish historiography, Bannockburn is rarely downplayed, and it was incredibly significant. The plunder alone enriched Bruce's soldiers and allies, and he was able to free his wife Elizabeth, his daughter Marjorie, and his sisters Mary and Christina, in return for the cousin of the ill-fated Henry de Bohun, Humphrey de Bohun, the fourth Earl of Hereford. And at first I was like, wow, so one man is worth four women, is it? It's given Rob Stark refusing to return Jamie Lannister to free Sansa, but go off. But then I saw that Humphrey was married to Edward's sister Elizabeth and that Elizabeth and Edward were very close. So rather than one man being kind of worth four women, perhaps it was that kind of Edward's sister pressed upon the king that, you know, Humphrey was to be returned no matter the cost and that the return of four of Bruce's own kin was actually an incredibly steep price to pay. The battle also showed that Bruce and his allies could not only outfox Edward's tactics through guerrilla warfare, but that they could face him in a pitched battle, a battle against incredible odds, and win. This must have been such a boost to morale and encouraged those who had remained bipartisan, either through apathy or pragmatism, to join Bruce's campaign. It was as decisive as it was unlikely, but the centuries since have done much to augment its role in both the story of Bruce and his struggle and in Scottish history on the whole. But it was not the end of the Wars of Independence. In 1320, the Declaration of Arbroath um, was kind of protesting England's continued attempts to subjugate Scotland, and even the peace treaty agreed in the Treaty of Edinburgh at Northampton in 1328 did not finish this period that is now known as the Wars of Independence. Bannockburn's momentousness has been collated over the centuries by poets like John Barber, by the National Trust's decision to open a Battle of Bannockburn Visitor Centre, and by the decision to hold Scotland's first independence referendum on the 700th anniversary of the battle. And the way we tell it, the way I have told it today, is by using it as a, a set piece, a kind of capstone that helps organise the events and kind of draw out a meaningful narrative. You know, if Alexander III's death was kindling, then perhaps the Stirling Bridge was the spark. Then there was a lull, kind of a moment where all seemed lost. And even after Bruce crowned himself, you know, it all rested on the edge of a knife. His years fighting from the shadows, leading to this incredible victory against all odds that set the dream of Scottish independence ablaze. It may be said that the rest of the wars are less immediately compelling, but not for want of trying. And for more of that, you shall have to wait until the next instalment of A Vague History of Scotland coming in the next few weeks. Thank you so much for watching and until next time.